Um, I did this talk last month at Black Hat with this title, Pixel Perfect Timing Attacks with HTML5. Um, that's actually a bit of a lie. Technically, nothing in this talk is to do with HTML5. There's, there's a lot of new browser stuff that people is in browsers, and people say, oh, it's HTML5. Um, so the, this is the, the slightly more honest title, uh, and it talks about SVG and CSS, which is really what I'm, what I'm going to show you in this talk. <coughs> so I'm talking about timing attacks. So what, what, what is a timing attack? So in general, we can think of uh, a timing attack as trying to uh, find out some information that is inside a black box. So there is some kind of secret in that black box, and we can put inputs into the black box, we get some kind of output, and we time how long the black box takes to process that input and give us an output. And we can give it another input, and we, again, we time that. And by comparing the inputs with the amount of time that it takes to process, we can, kind of, uh, we can sometimes do some kind of correlation and infer the secrets that are inside the box. And normally, we don't actually even care about the outputs. We um, sometimes just having the inputs and the times is all we need. Uh, and we can send lots and lots of inputs and find out some secret stuff. So what about web browsers? What kind of black boxes are there in web browsers that we could uh, perhaps do timing attacks on? So the, the foundation of uh, security in, it, in all web browsers is called the same origin policy. Uh, and the, the basic idea of that is that one website cannot read or change information on another website. But there are some little things that a site can do, um, one website can do that can still affect other websites. So you can request an image from another website and load that onto your site. You can load a script from another website. And you can use XML or HTTP requests to make requests to other websites as well. So you can do these small things, which in theory um, aren't a problem. Um, and that's because you can't read, read the res results back. Now the things I'm going to be looking at today are these. So again, these are kind of black boxes in web browsers. So when you have a link on a web page, the browser will color the link differently if you visited it than if you haven't visited it. Um, but again, the, the browser can't read that back. And iframes, of course, iframes are, are interesting. They've had lots of security problems. Um, and essentially, an iframe lets you load another website inside of your web website. But again, you can't read, the website can't read the contents of that, even though you can see it there on the page. So here's, um, here's an example of this. So on the left, we've got a bunch of links on a web page. You can see some of them are visited, some of them are not. And on the right-hand side, I've loaded my Amazon account page inside of an iframe. But the browser can't really see that. This is, this is kind of what the browser sees, is that you've got a bunch of links on the page. It doesn't know if you visited them. And it knows you, it's loaded uh, a site into the iframe, but it can't see anything in there. So what I'm going to do is uh, show how we can do browser history sniffing with a timing attack. I'm going to show how you can read pixels from the iframe with a timing attack. And I'm going to use new browser features that are nothing to do with HTML5. OK, so just uh, before I talk about that, I'm going to just show you a, a simple uh, example of a timing attack. And this is, a, this is a really old thing that's been possible in browsers for years and years and years. That it can't really be fixed. Um, but it's a, it's a good, good example of kind of the basics. So the question is, are you logged into Gmail? And here's some JavaScript that can help us find this out. So first of all, we get the current time. So we use date.now in JavaScript. That gives us the current time in milliseconds. And then we create a new image. Now, um, an image request is, is the very simplest possible way in JavaScript that you can fire off a, an HTTP request to another website. It doesn't matter that, that our request has nothing to do with an image. So in this case, we're going to say, go and fetch gmail.com. Now, uh, the browser will happily do that. At this point, it doesn't know that that's not actually an image. Um, but once it's fetched it, it will come back and say, aha, that's not an image. Uh, it's an error. Um, and we can use this error callback to take another timestamp. And we can tell the difference between the two timestamps time, time and figure out how long that request took. Very simple. Um, so back to the black box idea. Uh, in this case, the image request is the black box. The URL that we put into it is our input. Um, the on error callback is the output. And we can use date.now in JavaScript to time that. So what actually happens when, uh, when we do this request to Gmail? Well, if you're, uh, if you're not logged in, then uh, gmail.com will redirect you to the Google Accounts page. And the, the browser will follow those redirects. So it will keep following redirects, even though you've given it this one input URL. It will keep following redirects until it gets the result, at which point it will do that on error callback. 
So if you're not logged in, there's actually two, two requests the browser has to do. And if you are logged in, then uh, Gmail will uh, redirect to accounts, the Google accounts uh, site, which will say, ah, you're logged in. And then it will redirect you back to Google, and it'll do a couple more redirects. So the difference between the two cases is there are a lot more requests going on in the background if you are logged in. So we can, uh, I did a little test, just did this on my own computer. So I did a bunch of requests when I wasn't logged in. That's what you've got at, at the bottom. And a bunch of requests when you are logged in, and they take a lot longer because there's many more requests going on. So it's easy to see the difference between logged in and logged out. But that's a nice pretty graph, but can I actually tell if you're logged into Gmail? If I, if I get you to go to my site, I have some JavaScript that does this uh, request, and it gives me back, back a result of 500 milliseconds. Are you logged in or not? Now this, this is a good example of the problems uh, that we encounter when trying to do timing attacks. So if you're doing a, an attack over the network, you have problems like latency and jitter. So requests will take a different amount of time. And um, we don't necessarily know, I know how, how long it takes for my computer to get to Google, but maybe you're in a different part of the world, you've got a slower computer, um, or there's other things that can disrupt the timing. So these problems, we can, we can overcome them. So uh, to overcome latency and jitter, we can take lots and lots of measurements and take an average. Um, if I don't know exactly how long it takes to get to Google from where you are, well, I could do, uh, I could do a kind of calibration against a known target and say, well, I can do this request against this Google server, and I know it takes about this amount of time, and, and use that as my base. And if there's uh, lots of network requests going on from your computer, or if there's lots of programs running in the background, they might affect the timing. Well, the JavaScript can um, kind of wait a bit. If, if the web page is just open, it can wait until things have settled down before it starts doing these, uh, these timing attacks. OK, so I'm going to talk about history sniffing and how we can do this. So many, many, many years ago, uh, CSS history sniffing was something that every browser was vulnerable to before 2010. And it was a very simple attack. So um, here is some CSS, and all it says is that uh, to draw links that are not visited as blue and links that are visited uh, will be red. And then uh, this malicious website is trying to sniff your history. It will put a link on the page pointing to, say, PayPal. We want to know if you visited PayPal. And then use this little bit of JavaScript. You might not be able to see it at the bottom there. All it's, all it's saying, it's uh, getting a reference to the link and then calling a fu JavaScript function called get computed style. Uh, and basically, the, the browser will tell you what color the link is. So if it's red, it's visited. It's really, really simple. And uh, the website could do this not just for one link. It could do it for many, many thousands of links. It's very, very quick to do because there's no actual net network requests going on. Um, and yeah, so this is obviously a, a kind of quite a big problem. And it wasn't just theoretical. Um, in 2010, someone did a study uh, looking at the top 50,000 sites, and they found that a whole bunch of them were actually doing this history sniffing attack and sending the results back to a server. Uh, so, you know, invading people's uh, privacy, essentially. Um, and what they found is that the sites that were doing this um, were testing between about 20 and 200 URLs. So not that many, but that's apparently all, all they wanted to know was, you know, just testing these URLs to say, you know, if you've been to a competitive website, for example. So, so yeah, that's. Um, that wasn't good. And there was lawsuits and all, all kinds of stuff because of this. But unfortunately, well, fortunately, fortunately for people who use browsers, <laughs> um, this is fixed now. So uh, Mozilla uh, proposed a, a clever way to fix this in 2010. Um, all of the browsers have implemented, implemented this now, so it's not possible to do that simple history snipping. Um, and the way they fixed it was essentially uh, they made the browser lie to you about what color the link is. And they also ha um, added some restrictions on um, how you can style links that are visited. So you can only change the color. You can't have a background image, for example, um, that would cause a, another network request to happen. So um, they fixed it. Um, but I quite liked the history, history sniffing attack. Um, I thought it was fun, so I thought we'll bring it back and, and do, it again with, do it again with a, with a timing attack. So um, there is this new function in, in all browsers now called request animation frame. And this is going to be the basis for all of the uh, techniques I'm going to show you. So request animation frame, the purpose of it is to allow websites to do smooth animations. And what it does is um, it allows uh, a website to synchronize um, animations with the refresh rate of the browser. 
So what it, well, the way you use it is that you'll uh, call, pass a callback function to this, uh, to this function and say, let me know when you're just about to draw the next frame of animation. And I'll update, I'll say move, move my thing that's on the web page, I'll move it a little bit, and then uh, this function will get called back about 60 times a second, so to match the refresh rate of the browser. But the interesting thing about request animation frame is what happens if things slow down a bit. So if the graphics are a bit too complex in your web page, you've got a few too many things moving around, if your JavaScript's a bit slow, then that ideal frame rate of 60 frames per second will drop. And your callback function will be called less than 60 frames per second. And you can use this to measure the frame rate of the web browser. So we know, using this function, how long each frame takes to draw. And we can use this, potentially, to do timing attacks. So I'm going to show you a little video here. And this is a video of something uh, that you do every day. OK, so in this video, I'm going to type, a, uh, some, I'm going to type something into Google, and I'm going to visit a website. So if I play this. So I'm searching for HTML5, and I click on a Wikipedia link. So nothing particularly interesting going on there, you might think. But let's, let's slow this down a little bit. Let's slow it down and see what happened there. Let's see what happened when the, first, when the search results come up. So I'm going to go through frame by frame. OK, so the search results have popped up there. And if you have a look, again, people at the back might not be able to see, but the, the top link on the page is a link to Wikipedia, HTML5. And currently, that link is blue. And if I go a few frames forward, it's now changed to purple. So um, that link was visited. And what, did, what the browser did was, uh, first of all, it drew the link as not visited. It drew it as blue. Um, and then a few frames later, it, it repainted it. Now, why, why is that interesting? You, you, might, you might be wondering. Well, so let's, let's, uh, kind of, let's go through that again. So we break it down frame by frame. So what happens when you load a web page? So the page starts loading. So not, the page is blank to start with. And then the browser finds out that it needs to draw a link on the web page. So let's say it's a link to Google. So at the point it's, it knows it had to put this link on the, on, the, on the page, the browser will do a uh, request to its history database to basically say, uh, has the user visited this page before? But instead of waiting uh, for that result to come back. The browser wants to be nice and quick. So it actually will go ahead and draw that link anyway um, while this history, while this uh, request to the database is going on in the background. So it waits for this request to come back. So it draws a frame, and another frame. And then the result comes, up, comes back and says, yes, uh, you have visited, visited Google before. So it repaints the link as purple. So in this case, although we're kind of thinking of it in terms of frames, the browser only actually uh, had to paint something on the screen twice. So it had to paint the original link, and then it did nothing for a couple of frames, and then it repainted it as visited. So what, what about if, uh, if the link wasn't visited? Well, again, we go back. So it's, it's fired off this request to the history database, and the result comes back and says, you've not visited Google. Well, it doesn't have to do anything then. It doesn't have to repaint anything. So in that case, only, there was only one uh, paint event happened when it drew the original link. So this is quite interesting, because if we could detect when those repaints happen, we could tell if a link is visited. But unfortunately, request animation frame doesn't actually tell us about repaints. All it tells us about is the, the amount of time each frame takes to happen. So um, it would tell us each of those frames took, say, 60 milliseconds. But if we could slow down the paint event, if we could slow down the amount of time it takes to paint that link, then perhaps we could detect it. So here's something, again, which is not HTML5. Uh, this is CSS. It's been in CSS for years and years and years. But um, you can use text shadow in CSS to add a nice fancy drop shadow to your text. Um, the text shadow, text shadow is quite slow to draw. And um, you can actually control how slow it is 
uh, by making the shadow much more blurrier, or you can add multiple shadows. And basically, this, this is quite slow in most, in those, most web browsers. So here's, here's the original case where, uh, like I showed you in the video, everything's going nice and quickly. Every frame takes 16 milliseconds to draw because it's just drawing text on the screen. So it draws the original link, it repaints it, it's all nice and quick. Uh, if, we, if we use request animation frame, it, just tell, it would give us uh, 16 milliseconds between each frame, which doesn't tell us anything. But if we use text shadow, um, if we add a nice blurry shadow, and if we have lots and lots of links as well, if we, so if we have Google loads and loads on the web page, it has to draw each of those links uh, when it repaints, and it has to draw the shadow on each of those. So in this case, um, the, the two repaints that occur, they are much, much slower. So in this case, the two re repaints that occur might be, say, 60 milliseconds, and using request animation frame, we can detect that. So let's go back to the black box. So in this case, the whole uh, page rendering pipeline is kind of like our black box. And that link that we draw on the screen, that's our input. And we use request animation frames to get our output, output, which is the callback to say I'm about to draw the next frame. And the actual timing data is the delay between each frame. So here's how we could do a history sniffing attack. Um, and this, this method works in uh, Firefox and Internet Explorer because they both have that asynchronous um, URL database lookup in history. So what we do is we have a whole bunch of links we want to see if the user's visited. And for each one of those, we draw a whole bunch of uh, links on the screen with text shadow. And then as soon as we put those links on the screen, we use request animation frame to time how long the next few frames take to draw. Now, if there's one slow frame, say we time, we time five frames, say, after, after we've drawn them. So if there's one slow frame, we know that's because um, it had to draw the links on the screen, but then it didn't redraw anything, and it's, there's nothing visited. But if there are two slow frames, then we know that that URL is visited, and we repeat this for every single URL. Now, Chrome is a bit different. Chrome doesn't do that asynchronous history lookup. What it does is it actually um, waits until um, it knows whether that link is visited before it paints the next frame. Um, but we can, we can sl modify our method slightly in, uh, in Chrome because what it does is if you change where a link points to, then it will repaint that link if, it has, if the new target is now visited. So here's what we do in Chrome have a link that's pointing to somewhere we know is definitely not visited, just a made-up URL. And then in JavaScript, we uh, get a reference, reference to that link, and then we change, the, we change the target, we change the href. And then we have to do a little bit of uh, trickery with the styles. We have to um, uh, tell Chrome to recheck the styles by just kind of touching, touching the style and changing it back. That forces it to restyle. And then if the link is visited, it will repaint it. And if the new link is not visited, it won't repaint. So here's how we do it in Chrome. We make a whole bunch of uh, links uh, with text shadow pointing to somewhere that's not visited. And for each URL, we change the link to point to the new URL. We time just the next frame, the request, request animation frame. Um, and if that next frame is slow, then we know the link is visited. And this works in Chrome, and it also actually works in Firefox as well. So let's have a demo of that. So this is an Internet Explorer. OK, so what's going on here? All of this is completely visible to you at the moment, but it wouldn't need to be visible at all. We could hide those links. So on the left-hand side, we have a whole bunch of links which have text shadow. Um, and what this page is doing is cycling through all of those links on the right-hand side and changing uh, the links with the shadow on the left to point, point to each of those URLs. And each time it, ti it changes the URL, it times the next few frames, the next five frames, with the request animation frame. And you can see this on the right-hand side. Um, so uh, say the Google at the top there. So it changes the link to Google. And the first frame is, takes 77 milliseconds to draw. Uh, the next frame takes zero milliseconds, because it's, it's trying to catch up with being 60 frames per second. And the next frame after that takes 66 milliseconds or so. So that is visited. Uh, if you look at Facebook above that, well, only the first frame is slow in that case, so it knows it's not visited. So it's um, the links that have the green tick box on the left, it knows that they're visited. And as you can see, this, this is fairly quick to do. 
So I'll show you an uh, example in Chrome as well. So this, uh, this demo is a little bit more advanced. So um, at the start, I talked about calibration. So uh, depending on the speed of your computer, the text shadows will take a different amount of time to draw. So if your computer is too fast, then perhaps we won't be able to detect the timing. So we need to have bigger text shadow. So what this demo actually does is it starts off with a small text shadow, and it calibrates. So it, it finds uh, a bad text shadow that is large enough to slow down the painting. So you can see here it's calibrating. So it's doing a bigger and bigger text shadow. And there you go. So in Chrome, instead of having to t uh, time four frames, it only has to time the one frame, because the database lookup isn't, uh, isn't asynchronous. So again, in, in Chrome, it's pretty much the same, but a little bit quicker. So yeah, to summarize, we've got two similar methods. And across uh, those three browsers, um, the history sniffing works. So uh, you've got the asynchronous lookup, or you can change the target of the link. But we can do sni history sniffing in pretty much every browser. So um, yes, I talked about, talked about the calibration. Um, if you wanted to do this for real, um, like I said, you wouldn't have to have any of this stuff visible. We can use CSS to make those links really, really small but it will still take the same amount of time to paint them. Um, and as for how, many, how fast we can make it go, well, the demo I showed you in Chrome, that's testing about 16 URLs per second. Um, so in, uh, I came up with a slightly different method um, that works in IE that kind of tests URLs in parallel. Um, it, it's in the white paper, but I've not got time to talk about it now. Um, basically, we can get up to about 60 URLs per second, which is uh, plenty of time is plenty quick enough to do the same kind of attacks that were happening in the wild um, back in 2010. So you could do this in a few seconds or on a, in the real world. OK, so that's, that was the first part of my talk. That's um, issue sniffing. So now I'm going to talk about reading pixels from iframes. So SVG is a format that's supported by all browsers now. And it's definitely not part of HTML5 again. Um, and SVG lets us draw graphics, vector graphics in the web browser. Um, and one interesting fact is that HTML5 um, allows you to mix HTML elements and SVG elements in the same document. And you'll see why that's interesting shortly. So this is, uh, this is SVG, so there's paths and lines and stuff like that. All very simple. But what I'm looking at uh, today is SVG filters. So SVG filters let you do fancy effects. So they let you take the very simple line drawing from SVG and uh, apply these fancy filters to do kind of visual effects. So SVG filters uh, are, are 16 very basic filters that you can use and tweak the parameters. Uh, so things like uh, blurring, um, displacement maps, you can do convolution, you can, do, you can change the colors. Um, and using these basic operations, you can combine them uh, inside of a single filter to do very fancy effects. So you can do bump mapping, you can do drop shadows, all kinds of things. So SVG filters, they alter the appearance of the SVG, but um, it's a visual thing only. The, the JavaScript um, if you, on the web page can't really tell what the result looks like. So they can't, they can't see those pixels, they can't see the result. Um, but the the interesting thing is that in, in Chrome and in Firefox, we can apply SVG filters, not just to SVG elements, we can apply SVG filters to any HTML element we want. So this got me thinking, if I can apply, um, well, SVG filters are very complex. They're very complex number crunching algorithms. And if we can apply an SVG filter to, say, an iframe or a link, um, perhaps we could find a filter that takes a different amount of time to run, depending on what input we give it, depending on what element we apply it to. So, so here's, here's an example. We have one element and another element. We apply the same SVG filter to both of them. We time how long they take. And then perhaps, um, if the time's different, that would tell us something about those elements. So when I was thinking about this, I had a look in, in Firefox. Um, and I found this filter called FE morphology. So the details aren't, aren't, too, aren't too relevant, but the FE morphology basically uh, is used to make lines thicker or thinner. 
Um, and it takes a parameter called radius, which controls how thick or thin to make a line. So at the bottom you can see, uh, if you make it thicker, it's called dilation. If you make lines thinner, it's called erosion. And very briefly, this is how FE morphology works. So the size of the radius, the radius parameter you give it, defines the size of this box. So that orange box you see there. And the filter has to pass that box over every single pixel of the input image. And what it does is, for each pixel it puts this box around, it finds the lightest or the darkest pixel within that region, within that filter box, and it sets, uh, it sets the, the value of that pixel to be the same as the value of the lightest or the darkest pixel uh, there. So if it's erosion, it'll be the da darkest pixel. If it's dilation, it'll be the lightest pixel. Um, so it's quite a slow algorithm, and this is a little fancy animation here to show you. So, ready? Okay, so, so what it's doing is it's, it's passing that box over every single picture of the, the, the image, and it, as it goes, it's making the lines thicker. Now, this is quite slow because um, in the kind of uh, the naive way of doing it, you have to do a lot of comparisons. So uh, you'd have to take, uh, so if, uh, for the size of the image was width times height, you'd have to do width times height times uh, Rx times Ry, which is the radius of the box, you have to do that number of, of comparisons, which is quite slow. But Firefox uh, has this optimization. So this is the, the Firefox source code from uh, kind of an older version of Firefox. And again, the details aren't too uh, important. But the, the main thing here is that highlighted bit of code. There are three nested for loops there. And the outer two are uh, uh, looping through that filter box. And it has to do this for every single pixel of the, uh, of the input image. But there's, there's this optimization. So there's this separate bit of code, which will run in some cases, which, um, as you can see, there's only two for loops there. And in that, what that, that is doing is, instead of going through every single pixel of that uh, orange box, it's only looking at the right-hand column of pixels. So um, the case where the, this best case, this fast route would apply, is when we have a very flat image. So it's a bit difficult to see on the left there. But if you have an image that is completely flat, all the same color, then Firefox can always go down that, that, uh, that best case route. It can always go down the fast path, which uh, is only would have to do width times height times RY comparisons. So it's like many, many times quicker to apply to a flat image than to a noisy image that you have on the right-hand side. So essentially, we can take this filter. Um, if we apply it to a flat image, it'll be very slow, it'll be very quick. If we apply it to the right-hand image, it'll be very slow. So the problem is we're doing timing attacks. Normally, we, we don't really have a flat image, we, somewhere that's very flat and somewhere that's very noisy to compare. What we really want to do is tell the difference between, say, black pixels and white pixels. So here's how we can, we can do this. We can use a few more SVT filters to, to help us. So the first thing we can do is we, we take our input images, and then we, um, we take a no, an image of noise. And we can use SVT filters to multiply those two images together. So we take our input image, we multiply it by noise, and the output we get is either a black image or a noisy image, because in the, in the, the black image, every, pit, every value is zero, so zero times anything is zero. In the bottom image, all the values are one, so one times anything is one. So, we have a, uh, so again, we have a, uh, a black image and a noise image, which is what we want to be able to do this timing attack. So then we apply our uh, FE morphology, and we time how long it takes. So could we use this technique to actually read pixels from iframes? How, how could we do this? So here's what we do. We have our iframe on a web page, and we crop it down to a single pixel. So just one pixel, say, from the top left-hand side of the, the iframe. And then we can use CSS to enlarge the pixel many, many times. And then we apply this timing SVT filter and time how long the next frame takes to draw using a request animation frame. And then we can move on to the next pixel, and we can repeat that for the entire iframe, timing how long each pixel takes to, uh, to, to draw, essentially. So going back to the, the black box again, we have a uh, uh, black box, which is our SVT filter. We have a bunch of inputs, which are either black or white pixels. Uh, and then we, again, use request animation frames to how long, time how long these takes. And that, that's our attack. So let me just show you a quick uh, 
example of how SVG filters work. So here, here we've got an iframe uh, with a website loaded in it. And we can apply just a random SVG filter here. And you can see that the, uh, although it's, it looks different, we can still interact with the, with the site down here. So it's still, the site's kind of still live, um, but it's got this, this visual effect applied. So I was talking about white pixels and black pixels. Now, uh, on this website, yeah, there's some black pixels and white pixels, but not every white website is, is just black and white. Perhaps it's got colors in. So we want, we want black pixels and white pixels. Well, again, SVG filter is going to help us here. So we can make uh, a threshold filter using SVG. So, and we can, we can adjust how, you know, at what level uh, the pixel becomes black or white. So this, this uh, kind of shows how we get our input for our timing filter. Okay, so there's a few difficulties in doing this. It's not quite as straightforward as, as uh, I made it first appear. So, um, in, if you apply an SVG filter to an iframe, just as it is, uh, the browser will sometimes redraw the actual content to the iframe. So, in applying this filter, we're not, actually, we're not only timing how long the filter takes to draw, but possibly we're also timing how long the contents of the iframe take to draw, which is not ideal, because we just want to know about the SVG filter. So other things that are affecting the timing is not useful. So in Firefox, there's a very uh, useful CSS attribute called Moz Element. And what this lets us do is set the background of an element to look like another element. So it lets, essentially lets us take a snapshot of another element. Um, and that just becomes like a background image. It's, you can't actually interact with it. So when we apply an SVG filter to this snapshot, it only has to deal with the SVG filter. It doesn't have to deal with redrawing the, the entire uh, DOM and uh, the contents of the iframe and all the text and so on. Um, so, and to, to blow up the, uh, to go from a tiny uh, one by one pixel to something a bit, bit bigger, we can, it will be nice and slow to apply our filters to, we can use um, CSS transforms. So, Let's have a demo. So I, I'm demoing this in a, uh, an older version of Firefox, because this is now being fixed in Firefox. Right, so. So this is my target. So uh, this is a Google Plus comments widget. Um, and the reason I chose this is because, you know, a lot of websites these days actually prevent framing from happening. So because of things like click, click jacking, they'll use um, head like x frame options to say, don't, don't allow this site to be framed, which is a good thing. Um, but some, in some cases, you can't really do that. So in the case of this Google Plus comments widget, um, it has to allow itself to be framed. So this is why I used it. Um, and as you can see, uh, it has my name in it there. So if I, if I go to, uh, say, a, a blog post on any blogger website that has comments, this widget will be on the site. Um, but I can just load up the, the widget on its own inside my own malicious site. Um, and the aim here is to try and read my name, to try and figure out who I am by reading this text. Okay, so here's, here's my test page. Again, none of this would necessarily be visible. This is just to, just to show uh, kind of what's going on. So in the top frame here, we have the actual, uh, this widget loaded inside of my iframe. This one down here, we have, um, this is using that uh, Firefox uh, attribute called uh, Moz Element. So this is like a snapshot of, uh, of the iframe, kind of zoomed in a bit so you can see the pixels. And on the bottom here, we have, um, this is just this single pixel, this is this top left, left hand pixel here with our timing filter applied. So if we turn on the threshold, you get nice black and white pixels. So it's a bit difficult to see in this light, but um, when the top left-hand pixel is white, uh, this kind of changes slightly. It's still kind of dark with the filter applied. Um, but when, I, when this pixel is black, this goes completely black. And we can, we can time how long it takes. And we can take a few timings to, uh, as well, um, kind of average that out. So in this case, if the pixel is, is white, 
we have uh, kind of quite a slow time. And if the pixel is black, oops, oh, hang on. Uh, okay, I'm running it now. Anyway, so yeah, so it's it's doing this now. So it's going through every single pixel. It's timing how long it takes to apply the, the filter to that pixel, and it's building up an image on a canvas here, of, uh, of my, in this case of my name. So as you can see, it's pretty quick. There we go. <laughs> so, you know, on, on the left-hand side, the, the, the site can't actually see what's inside of here. But now this is on the canvas, it can send this back to my uh, malicious server, and it, in this case, it would have de-anonymized me. So, you know, that's a pretty, that's pretty neat, right? But it is quite slow, and, it, and you know, okay, that took 30 seconds, but that was only a very short amount of text. It was just a few characters. So the question is, could we speed this up a bit? And if we make some assumptions about the text in the website, perhaps we, we, can, we can, make, can make it quite a lot quicker. So what if we knew the font that was being used and the size of the font? And also, what if it was a, a fixed width font, so the, the space between each character was, was the same? And if we knew exactly where on the page uh, to look for this particular bit of information we're after? So there is one case where these assumptions uh, apply. And that is uh, in the view source uh, of, of uh, Firefox. So if you right click on a web page, view source, you get the source code of the web page. It's in this nice fixed width font. Um, one kind of little trick you can do in Firefox is if you load a, a URL into an iframe and you put view dash source on the front of it, it'll actually load the source code of the website in the iframe instead of the, the site itself. Um, and there's lots of interesting stuff in, in the source code of the website. There might be uh, tokens, IDs, cross site request forgery tokens, authentication tokens, all kinds of things we might want to be might want to go after. So what if we could do some kind of OCR technique on the text? What if we knew enough about the font to know which pixels were used by certain characters? So let's take at the bottom there's number six. What if we took that pixel? Is that pixel just used by number six? Is it also used by some, other, by some other characters? So if we knew enough about the fonts, if we analyze the fonts enough, perhaps we could only read some pixels from a certain character to know which character it is, instead of having to read every single, every single pixel, which would be quite slow. So here, here's how this would kind of work, right? So unlike real-world OCR, in which thing, the text is always different, it's a bit fuzzy, we don't know how big it is, yeah, the fonts on the computer are always exactly the same. So if we, let's say we analyze the font, and we start off with one pixel. So we know, say, uh, this pixel, 4 by 5 is always used by the characters A and B, uh, but it's not used by C or D. So we read that pixel, and let's say it's white, uh, in which case, so it's, it's used. Um, and then, okay, so we know it's A or B, so we pick a different pixel to, to differentiate between those two characters. And again, if it's white, then we know, okay, it's A, uh, and if it's black, we know it's B. So we can kind of build up this tree uh, using uh, knowledge about the fonts to just read a few pixels. So here's, here's how I did it. So I wrote some JavaScript to, instead of uh, sitting down and manually analyzing a font, which would be quite slow, um, I wrote some JavaScript to do it for me. So here's our, here's our input. So in this case, we're using uh, the Courier font, which is what Firefox uses to view source. Uh, and I've blown it up a bit. And then I apply uh, this threshold filter again. So again, we've got black and white pixels. And I take each of those characters there, in this case, just hex, and I draw each character, I combine all the characters together on top of each other to build up a kind of heat map. Now, what this heat map, what this heat map shows is uh, how many times each pixel is used. But in this case, the, the red pixels are the really interesting ones because those pixels are only used by exactly half of the characters. Um, the orange ones, so, so the red pixels are used by eight characters, in this case with hex. The, the orange pixels are this is slightly off balance, so maybe they, they're used by uh, nine characters and they're not used by the rest. Um, and the kind of really light pixels are ones that are either used by kind of all, all of the characters or only used by one, which are not so interesting. But the red, pix red pixels are the, one, the ones that we want to uh, let us build our binary tree. So uh, how this algorithm works, um, so the JavaScript will start off with all the characters, it build up this heat map, and it'll pick one of the red pixels, say, okay, uh, that pixel is used by, for example, 4, 7, A, B, C, D, E, and F. 
And then it will take those characters and build up another heat map. Uh, draw them all on top of each other, find the red pixel, which is, is by half. And then, so again, it will divide into, draw everything on top of each other. And we keep going down until we have a heat map that differentiates between just two characters. So in this case, at the bottom there, that particular character is used by seven, but not by F. So we build up this nice binary tree. And for the case of um, hex, there are four steps from the top to the bottom. So this means we only need to read four pixels uh, to, to tell what hex character is on a page. So this kind of shows this up here. So uh, the orange pixels there are the, the pixels that we would have to read for each character. So as you can see, it's a massive, massive reduction in the number of pixels we need to read in order to read text. So in general, um, for a character, set, a character set that's two to the n large, we have to read n pixels. So uh, for hex, we have four, we have to read four pixels. If we wanted to read, say, lowercase text, that would be uh, five pixels we'd have to read. And if we wanted to read, say, base64 or you know, just uppercase, lowercase text, some symbols, then um, yeah, we can have to read six pixels. So this, this is a, a lot better. So time for my final demo. So what I'm going after in this case is the, again, the Google Plus widget is quite interesting. So the Google Plus widget uh, has your entire Google Plus profile in the source code in kind of JSON format. So all, the, all that private stuff that's in your Google uh, profile, like stuff like your phone number that you might not make visible to anyone, all that is inside uh, the source code of that, that comments widget, which is quite interesting. So there's email addresses, telephone numbers, uh, you know, it's kind of, Kind of interesting, an interesting target. So again, we're very much similar to the previous demo. At the, the top here, this is the output of that JavaScript algorithm that analyzed the fonts. This is the kind of the raw data of that binary tree. And yeah, here's the source code. And it's going to go after three pieces of information. It's going to go after my, uh, my Google Plus ID, which will uniquely identify me. And it's going to try and pull out two telephone numbers. So, fingers crossed this will work. So it's calibrated. So we're actually reading my, my Google ID. It's reading my telephone number. I have changed that, by the way. This is not actually my telephone number. <laughs> and there's a mobile phone number. So this is much, much quicker than before. Right, so what, what browsers does this work in? So, like I said, the, the view source um, only works in, in Firefox, but both Chrome, both, both Chrome and Firefox let us apply SVG filters to HTML. Um, and the, the timing attack, um, so that same FE morphology filter there are, does work in Chrome. There are, I think there are other filters as well. Um, I reported this, my initial research was done in Firefox, and they now fixed this in the latest version of Firefox. Um, Chrome is not fixed yet, but they're working on it. So how can, the, how can the browser makers actually fix these things? It's actually quite complex. So when I first reported this to Mozilla, um, the first thing they did was uh, they took out that separate path in the FE morphology filter. So they took out that, that quick case, which basically made the filter slower. Um, but actually, that didn't quite fix the timing attack. Um, it kind of reduced the timing difference but it was, the difference was still there. And the reason was um, because although there were no actual branches within the code, if you kind of went and looked at the, um, the generated assembly, there were still some branches in there just because of compiler optimizations. And they took three or four goes to actually uh, change the code to produce uh, assembly that had no, no branches in, so it was always exactly the same. So Firefox, uh, Mozilla have uh, fixed that one filter. They have, um, which is what I've used for my, for my proof, proof of concepts, they have removed the kind of branches from the other filters, but they've not been tested, so there may still be some timing differences in, uh, in Firefox and other filters. So that's the, that's the SVG stuff. What about the uh, reading the history, the history sniffing? So with redrawing the links, um, one way to fix it may be to always redraw the link, uh, whether it's visited or not. So every single link on the page, draw it twice, which, is, again, is not great. It's a trade-off. You know? so, that would slow down the browser, which is not great. The browsers want to be as fast as possible. And again, with the filters, you know, slowing things down isn't necessarily the, the, the best 
the best thing for people actually using the browsers. Um, the other thing perhaps they could do with the SVG filters is not allow filters to be applied to things like iframes and links. Um, and in terms of uh, protecting yourself, well, obviously web websites should all be using X-frame options anyway, so they shouldn't allow themselves to be framed uh, in most cases. And if you're particularly worried about this, well, I guess you could um, clear your history lots, use private browsing mode, but really it's, it's something for the, the browser makers to fix. So that's it, thank you.